it is my great pleasure today to introduce Graham Shirley, who is um, one of our um, RIHS councillors. And uh, before Graham joined the RIHS Council, he had a long and distinguished career as a director, writer and researcher on Australian historical documentaries. He has conducted many, many oral histories, is co-author of a publication, Australian Cinema, the first 80 years. Between 2006 and 2014, he worked for the National Film and Sound Archive initially as a senior curator and later as the NFSA historian. In 2014, he returned to freelance researching, writing and consulting. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us about an extraordinary uh, part of our history, our shared history, um, Australia's travelling film exhibitors. And he's going to look at the home talent, the way they utilise people in the local area to make these films. And he will look at how a stock standard script called The Adventures of Dot was repeatedly filmed uh, at its, uh, as its itinerant directors and cameramen visited town after town. So please join me in welcoming Graham Shirley. Films have always had inner lives and outer lives that have involved journeys. Inwardly, the content of the film is a journey in itself, with the classic narrative of most dramatised films involving setup, conflict and resolution. But the outer form of a film's carrier, be it on celluloid, video or digital media, has been on numerous physical journeys. Films have arrived in this country by ship or by plane. They've travelled around Australia since the days of horse-drawn carts. And between 1896 and the 1950s, they were toured around Australia by itinerant showmen. Some of these showmen were also filmmakers. The first films to come to Australia were imported by showmen from America and France. In Sydney and Melbourne from August 1896, the American magician Carl Hertz was the first to present moving images to a paying Australian audience. Within a month, a visiting Frenchman, Maria Sestier, was the first to shoot as well as project Australian films. After making and screening films in Sydney and Melbourne, Sestier toured his films around Australia. Travelling Magic Latin or slide projectionists had preceded the picture showmen. Among them were staff of the Melbourne-based Salvation Army's Limelight Department, which was formed under Joseph Perry's leadership in 1892. By the mid-1890s, the Limelight Brigade was touring Australasia using Latin shows for religious presentations and fundraising. The Limelight Department in 1897 started making short films about Salvation Army activities. And in 1898, these films went on tour. Also toured was the Limelight Department's two-and-a-half-hour multimedia presentation of 1900, Soldiers of the Cross. Sidney Cook was one of the Limelight Department's cameraman projectionists. After leaving the Salvos, Sid became an independent filmmaker and exhibitor, and he was one of Australia's busiest makers of so-called local actuality films. After his death in 1937, the Brisbane Courier Mail reported that Sid Cook had, quote, made history in many an outback settlement and town by photographing the streets and gardens and the pedestrian and vehicular traffic by day, and showing the moving pictures at night. It's only in recent years that sustained attention has been paid to the great popularity of local or community films in the first decades of cinema. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the British company Mitchell and Kenyon filmed at least 800 two-minute films in towns and cities around the UK. These films were hugely popular when screened for the communities who had been filmed. In Australia, cameraman projectionist Leonard Corrick was a member of the Corrick family of entertainers who toured a mixture of live concerts, variety sketches, and mostly imported films between 1901 and 1914. Leonard was the family's projectionist from 1905, and his collection of films included those from France, the USA, the UK, and Italy. In 1907, the Corricks bought a 35mm film camera and Leonard made at least six films, which screened as part of the Corrick shows. In 1907, they included the titles Street Scenes in Perth, Bashful Mr Brown, and The Day Postle Race, 
street scenes in Perth and the coverage of the Arthur Postle versus Beecham Day foot race at Kalgoorlie drew significant audiences, including those who had appeared in the films and those who had watched the filming. The production of Australian newsreels began in 1910. From that time on, newsreels were a regular part of cinema programming until the mid-1970s. Their cameramen, like documentary cameramen, often had an itinerant life as they filmed around Australia. Most of the newsreel companies were headquartered in capital cities, but some cameramen were closely connected to country town cinemas. While those cameramen filmed on a freelance basis for the major newsreels, occasionally they also shot for a town's own newsreel, which was screened at a local picture theatre. What was behind the making of regional newsreels was a town's desire to see films of their own people, district and activities on screen. These films shared their town screen with imported films, connecting the townspeople and their film to the wider world. In 1917, Parramatta resident William Barter made his own movie camera and filmed local scenes and comedy shorts which were screened at Parramatta's Butterfly Theatre. In 1919, Barter completed a locally shot comedy feature length film called Willie Twist with a mostly amateur cast. The film, fragments of which survive today, screened at the Butterfly on the 29th and 30th of May. Film historian Ian Griggs has written, The audience loved it. Barter constantly crept from the box to gauge the public reaction, only to return grinning with satisfaction. In December 1920, Perth-based cameraman Fred Murphy and his co-director Hamilton Brown made The Silent Raid, a community comedy short. Produced for a fundraising body with the remarkable name of the Ugly Men's Association, The Silent Raid was made to raise funds for the Perth Children's Hospital Outpatients Ward. The filming, which took place across Perth, had drawn crowds of onlookers who were also among the audiences who flocked to see the finished film when it ran for a week at Perth's Palladium Theatre. In 1927, local pride was surely in the minds of the 72 New South Wales towns who entered the Country Women's Association's Beautiful Towns competition. Each of the entrant towns received free of charge a 10-minute actuality or documentary film made about their town. The producer of the films was a company called Community Films Limited, who would soon embark on the making of community comedies. Throughout the early 1900s, community comedies had mushroomed in small towns and cities across the USA. Most of them were produced by itinerant filmmakers. In the days before affordable home movies and a century before camera phones, these films served regional audiences' hunger to see themselves, their children, their relatives and friends, and their town on screen. Often the same scripts were filmed again and again as their producer-director cameraman visited a string of towns in succession. In 19th century pre-cinema America, the term home talent had often referred to untrained or poorly trained professionals, including actors, who were considered in a category apart from the trained professionals who lived and worked in regional areas. In time, the home talent label was also applied to narrative films starring amateur actors. Most of the home talent films produced across the US and later across Australia ran no more than 15 to 20 minutes and were silent, with on-screen titles to explain action and convey dialogue. Their brevity enabled them to be screened along mainstream Hollywood films in a cinema of the town where the film had been made. Home talent films for a while helped to guarantee capacity audiences in their town of origin. In New Zealand in the late 1920s, professional producer-director Rudel Haywood and his wife Hilda made ends meet by travelling the countryside filming two dozen short comedies featuring home talent. A Daughter of Dunedin, made in 1928, still survives. As I found when I saw it at a Dunedin cinema in 2008, this film has aged well and it effortlessly entertained its 21st century audience especially those familiar with Dunedin. By the late 1910s and into the 20s, the worldwide success of Hollywood films promoted universal interest in how movies were made, along with what chances the average citizen had of becoming a film star. In Sydney at that time, Snowy Baker and a man called P.J. Ramster ran film acting schools. But for those who couldn't afford a film school, there was a sporadic trend in how films are made presentations. 
in Australia in 1924, Australian-born Hollywood film star Louise Lovely and her husband Wilton Welsh toured Australia with their A Day at the Studio Act. The act invited cinema audience members to take screen tests that, having been filmed, were screened a week later. Similarly, in early 1928, after appearing in the Australian feature film The Romance of Runnybead, Hollywood actress Eva Novak toured Australian cinemas with an act called How Movies Are Made. Eva Novak's husband, William Reed, had recently worked on two professional Australian feature films, and so had the US-based cinematographer Len Roos. On the 19th of February 1927, between shooting those two professional films, Len Roos was featured in a Lismore newspaper advertisement promoting a new initiative by the New South Wales North Coast exhibitor Thomas J. Dorgan. Dorgan's chain of theatres eventually extended from Mwilumbar to Grafton, and he was keen to boost cinema attendances by funding home talent films. The February 1927 advertisement reported that Dorgan had secured the services of Len Roos to make a series of films on the North Coast, and that the first of them would be called The Adventures of Dot. The ad continued that the entire cast will be made up of Lismore bona fide residents. Production would begin on March the 4th, and the finished film screen two weeks later. The Lismore version of The Adventures of Dot was the first in what would be an enduring franchise. From then on, it was filmed repeatedly across Australia, using Len Roos's own screenplay, a copy of which today is held by National Archives of Australia. For the Lismore version, Pearl Walker was elected to play Dot, and Norman Morris and C.E. Harrison were cast as rivals for her hand. The Northern Star newspaper predicted on the 19th of March that the leads would be able to be seen among Lismore scenes familiar to residents of the town every day. One great attraction will be to see how these streets and pretty bits of scenery look on the screen and how they compare with places in other parts of the world. From the 21st of March 1927, in its three screenings at the Star Court Theatre, the Lismore version of Dot played to crowded houses. The Adventures of Dot's storyline begins with the arrival of the town's new school teacher called Dot Farley. She is welcomed by Bill Cummings, a grocery clerk, and Andy Webb, an apprentice with a local newspaper, and both men are instantly smitten with her. They're also standing for election as aldermen of the town council. To give himself the advantage with Dot, Andy fakes a newspaper story to claim that Bill is a wanted criminal. Bill, however, is elected alderman. Thanks to the suspicions of the local constable, Andy is accused of framing his rival and confesses to Dot. This enables Bill to win the hand of Dot. At the end, they seem to have a rosy future together. As well as the several versions of Dot directed in 1927 by Len Roos, three were directed early the following year by Cyril Sharp in the New South Wales towns of Tamora, Young and Grenfell. All three of the Sharp films survive. Even by the standards of the late 1920s, they are quite roughly made. What is especially valuable, however, are the degrees to which each of these towns was showcased. In the Tamora and Grenfell versions, there is a fair amount of footage of the town and its people. But the young version delays the start of its plotline for seven minutes to show a very detailed coverage of day-to-day -day life in that town. What we see are introductory wide shots of the town, cycle races at the showground, and lawn bowls, and women's and men's tennis. There are no interiors, and each of the films has an editorial looseness, complete with repetition of actuality shots and occasional unintended repeated character actions from one shot to the next. In mid-March 1928, Grenfell's local newspaper announced that Cyril Sharp would direct the Grenfell version of The Adventures of Dot for that town's Royal Theatre. The film was completed by early April and was the advertised main attraction at the Royal Theatre. In late April, the film was repeated by popular demand at Grenfell Star Theatre. Let's now view three and a half minutes from this film. Grenfell locals Sadie Logan, E.C. Dodd and Roy Roper played Dot, Bill and Andy.
I'll return to the adventures of Dot in a moment. Meanwhile, I'll move back to the North Coast exhibitor, Tom Dorgan. In early 1928, he was among exhibitors financing a new home talent initiative. It was called Hollywood on Holidays, and it was produced and directed by the previously mentioned William Reed. Hollywood cameraman Dal Clawson shot all of the Hollywood on Holidays films. Each of them running 20 minutes was funded by the cinema exhibitor who invested in the film shot in their town or territory. By the start of February 1928, Reed and Clawson had made three such films. They were Tam of Tamworth, Olive of Orange and Priscilla of Parks. These films were completed within eight days. Part of their appeal was audiences being able to watch the filming of exteriors in the district and then paying to watch interiors being shot on the stages of the cinemas at which the films would be shown. When they were shown, Tam of Tamworth, Olive of Orange and Priscilla of Parks proved to be strong attractions. The making of Olive of Orange triggered Australia-wide headlines in an incident that showed that the rushed nature of home talent filmmaking had its dangers. On the night of 8th of February 1928, more than 500 citizens had gathered in front of Orange's Australia Picture Theatre to watch the filming of a scene in which the heroine emerged from a car to enter the theatre. Directly after the filming, a large lighting flare fell to the road while still burning and rolled under a car. As the crowd scattered in all directions, the film's electrician, Cecil Hargraves, rushed forward to grab the flare, which then exploded, severely maiming it. A local resident stooped to pick up a second flare, whereupon film director Bill Reed ran up to him, intending to snatch the flare and throw it away. The Sydney Morning Herald wrote that before Reed could toss the flare, it exploded, as the first had done, and just at the moment when both their right hands were resting on it, and they were shockingly injured. Tari's Manning River Times reported that it was thought that the bombs had become defective during transport from America. Despite this appalling incident, the Hollywood and Holidays films continued to draw capacity audiences. By the end of March 1928, a fourth Hollywood and Holidays film had been shot in Lismore, Casino and Grafton, featuring residents of those towns. Called The Razor Gang, it was a comedic melodrama about the discovery of a formula to eradicate a banana virus called Bunchy Top and the efforts of the Grafton gang to obtain it. The film partly survives today, as these frames confirm. Let's return to the adventures of Dot Films, most of which were produced under the auspices of the linked companies, Community Films and Cameo Productions. From July 1928, and for another two decades, all of the remaining versions of The Adventures of Dot were directed by one man. He was the producer, director, and cinematographer, Jack M. St. Ledger. By all accounts, he had quite a fascinating life. The information I've found so far about Jack St. Ledger's early life has its contradictions, but it seems that Jack McSeldo St. Ledger was born in El Paso, Texas, on the 19th of June, 1881. By World War I, he had toured Australia twice with circuses, and on the second trip, he was billed as the sharpshooter Mexican Jack. He married Lillian Hornby at Albury in 1908, and they were to have five children. Jack seems to have spent much of 1920 to 1925 back in the USA. When he returned to Australia in 1925, he was publicised as an itinerant cameraman, who filmed sponsored documentaries and appeared in a travelling show called A Day at the Studio. In May 1927, he was at the Royal Theatre Windsor, New South Wales, filming screen tests for what he described as finding screen types for future Australian productions. In July 1928, Jackson Ledger's earliest adventures of Dot seems to have been the version of Warwick, Queensland. When, on the 5th of July, Warwick's Her Majesty's Theatre advertised that they were going to bring to Warwick a complete motion picture producing unit, Jack was described as an American who came directly from Hollywood. After the film premiered at Her Majesty's in mid-July, the Warwick Daily News reported that the filmed 1100 feet entertained a record audience for 15 minutes without a single lapse into dullness. Before long, St. Ledger had a set routine with the adventures of Dot. The first that local citizens knew Dot would be filmed in their town was a newspaper article or advert headed 
are you a screen type or who will be dot? Young women wanting to become dot had to be nominated by a friend and then voted upon by the townspeople. Those hoping to appear in other roles in the film would contact the local cinema manager. The casting of the male lead rivals and of real life figures playing on screen equivalents of themselves, such as the mayor, newspaper editor, and chief fireman, would be made by Jack St. Ledger. Filming usually started several days after St. Ledger arrived in town, and sometimes he would shoot screen tests, sometimes not. After the film had been shot, town newspapers advised readers when it was being edited, when it would premiere, and how local audiences reacted to screenings. Although earlier itinerant filmmakers had processed, printed, and edited their films as they travelled, it seems that St Ledger had laboratory and editing work for all of his dot films conducted at the nearest capital city. For instance, in the early 1930s, the dot films were edited at Sydney's Standard Tone sound recording studios. By 1940, St Ledger's interstate editing bases included Melbourne. Australia's capital city press and film magazines almost never wrote about St Ledger or the adventures of Dot, but coverage in the newspapers of the towns in which the Dot films were made could be detailed. It was also invariably positive and uncritical. Country newspapers regarded the films as harmless pieces of fun, which were good for promoting community spirit, as well as showcasing the locality. It seems Hobart was the only capital city featured in the adventures of Dot, a review in that city's Mercury newspaper on the 28th of April 1934 came the closest to a critique when it said, Each of the players makes the most of the allotted parts. Though the story provides little opportunity for characterisation, the actors may be said to have made a successful debut. Their interpretations evoke continued merriment from first night patrons. Occasionally, an Adventures of Dot film was made in what was then an outer suburb. An example of this was Sydney's Parramatta, where the film was commissioned by what was then called the Roxy Spanish Theatre. The Cumberland Argus and Fruit Growers Advocate reported that during filming in April 1931, huge crowds, mostly of young men, followed the performances and the cinematographer about for days. Premiering on the 9th of May 1931, the film ran at the Roxy for a week. In July 1934, the film trade magazine Everyone's reported that the adventures of Dot films have been a huge success with every showman who had screened them. The Wollongong and Newcastle versions were billed as their cinema's main attractions. In March 1928, the Wollongong version was reported by the local newspaper in these terms, that not only had it attracted a full house, but many were turned away. The views of Wollongong in this picture were very fine, especially the panoramic from the high school. The stars who took part acted with great ease and demonstrated suitable screen types are to be found in Wollongong. Repeated screenings of Newcastle's Adventures of Dot at that city's Civic Theatre and two other cinemas in January 1931 meant a much bigger than average hit. An 8th of January advert in the Newcastle Sun claimed 15,000 people have already seen it and the theatre rings with applause at each screening. Yuan A. Corbett was singled out by the press and subsequently by Jack St. Ledger as a particularly fine actress in the title role. The Newcastle Sun, on the 5th of January 1931, wrote, The picture opens up an interesting field of speculation as to what in future might be done in this direction with Newcastle as a background. Brief as the picture is, it contains many scenes which bring a fresh realisation of the beauty of places which the man in the street does not particularly notice being so familiar with them. Regarding the Port Adelaide version of the film, the Adelaide News of the 22nd of April 1937 reported, large crowds at all theatres cheered the film and the actors. On the 19th of December 1940, the Albany Advertiser wrote about the screening of Albany's version with, immense enthusiasm greeted the appearance on the screen of various local identities. Despite the fact that they had little time for rehearsal, the three stars, or starlets, played their parts very well and confidently. A number of local identities made brief appearances in more or less characteristic poses, much to the delight of the audience. The review commented that the film made a very pleasant change from the more sophisticated Hollywood-type film. The Glenelg version of The Adventures of the Dot was financed by that suburb's Strand Theatre. 
in early March 1938, newspapers called for locals to apply for the leading roles. Advertisements announced which local beauty spots would be filmed on which days, and the film premiered at Glenelg Strand and Seaview Theatres on the 2nd of April before continuing at the Strand for a week. The next segment is from Glenelg's Adventures of Dot. We see Bill and Andy's rivalry for Dot starting to heat up with a false fire alarm and a confrontation outside the local newspaper office. From 1930 to 1940, Jack St. Ledger made a known 28 dot films and was constantly on the move. Prior to that, in 1928-29, he spent much time in Queensland and New South Wales. He focused again on both states in 1930-31 and was back in Queensland in 1932. In the years from 1936 to 1938, he filmed frequently in South Australia. After that, he made dot films in Western Australia between November 1938 and December 1940. Various newspaper articles of the decade indicate that between making the dot films, St Ledger continued to film screen tests with regional screen hopefuls. Within days of the tests, he screened the results to audiences of the cinemas in which they'd been filmed. But St Ledger and his wife and children paid a personal price for his itinerant life. In January 1937, his wife Lillian applied to the New South Wales Supreme Court for a divorce on the grounds of desertion. In March 1938, a decree absolute on the grounds of desertion was pronounced, ending the marriage. That same month, Jack was directing The Adventures of Dot in Glenelg. What was Jack St. Ledger like as a filmmaker? Only one of his Adventures of Dot films, the Glenelg version of 1938, survives in addition to the three 1928 versions directed by Cyril Sharp. Ten years after Sharp's at times primitive versions, St. Ledger's film is reasonably polished, at times imaginative. The cast perform with more conviction and self-assurance than those of the Sharp films. 
the pacing of the story is better, allowing it to breathe and avoid being perfunctory. When did the making of the Adventures of Doc films eventually finish? After the Albany version of 1940, the output of these films was suspended for the rest of World War II. It's not known what Jackson Ledger did in the intervening years, but in June 1947, he made an Adventures of Dot in Rockhampton. In September 1947, St. Ledger made another Dot film in Warwick. This was the town in which he'd made his first ever version in 1928. Since long-term residents would have had memories of the earlier film, the 1947 remake was called The New Adventures of Dot. But there was nothing new about the plotline. Publicity for this film, when it screened in October and November 1947, revealed the plot was exactly the same as before. For reasons that probably included the greater post-war sophistication of audiences and the fact that the content of mainstream films was radically changing, the 1947 New Adventures of the Dot seems to have been the last of Jack St. Ledger's community films. After 20 years of having greatly entertained regional Australian audiences with their local characters and scenes, the adventures of Dot and other home talent films were now forgotten. I've not yet discovered whether St. Ledger ever wrote or was interviewed about his life. At some point he remarried. In 1962, in his early 80s, he died when struck by a car in rural Victoria. Up until now, the full story of Australia's home talent films has hardly ever been told. It's possible today by using trove digitised newspapers and magazines to find many articles and adverts about the individual dot films and other Australian home talent films when they were made. But sustained retrospective research, analysis, publication about and recognition of these films still needs to be done. The potential resources are there, not only via trove, but also via Australia-wide historical societies, libraries, archives, museums, and family history collections. And what about the films themselves? Out of the at least 50 home talent films shot around Australia between 1927 and 1947, a mere four are known to survive, all of them held today by the National Film and Sound Archive. The films that do survive and the stories around them capture not only the evolution of Australia's home talent film, but also the communities that appeared in them. The four surviving dot films are valuable time capsules of the towns in which they were filmed. They're also full of clues about the lives of the people who appear in them. For example, those starring in the Glenelg version look prosperous, while a percentage of the school children in Grenfell's The Adventures of Dot a decade before are barefoot. The version shot in Young, New South Wales in 1928 shows that one of its leading stars may not, for whatever reason, have had access to adequate dental care. If more of these films could be found and their background stories discovered, we would have a greater record of the individual character as well as the shared experiences of regional communities across Australia. Exploring the story of Australia's home talent filmmaking will also fill a significant gap in Australian film history. And if more of the adventures of dot films can be found, that will be a bonus. Before concluding, I'd like to thank Australia's National Film and Sound Archive for their supply of video clips and a number of the still images used in this talk. The NFSA is Australia's audiovisual archive and the custodian for over 3 million items, including film, television, audio, video, digital media and documents. Thank you, Graham, and please everyone join us in giving Graham a virtual applause. So we might move on to questions now. And uh, so we already have one and it, it asks, did any of the actors go on to work in professional films, Graham? Not that I know of. Um, you, uh, the, you are a Corbett who is, first name is spelled J-U-A-N-E. Um, she was the star of the Newcastle version. She already had a career as a, as a dance and movement teacher, particularly for, for school children. Um, and she also produced live stage shows. There's a fair bit about her in the early to mid 1930s context in Trove digitized newspapers. And then she sort of disappears, which, which implies she either, you know, moved away from Australia or married. And so the name changed, but no, there, there are no other people that, um, you know, beyond, beyond her, and she was quite well known to the Newcastle community, there were no other people that, that achieved any kind of degree of fame. 
We have a question from Christine asking, would these um, filmmakers have used nitrate film stock? Yes, they did. Um, they certainly did. I th are there are suggestions that one or two of the later films may have been shot on 16 millimeter, but certainly uh, what the National Film and Sound Archive holds for um, two of the films, the uh, um, one of the versions from 1928 and, and the version from 1938 uh, are on nitrate. The others are held on 16 millimeter, but they they were what they what they what you'd call reduction copies. They'd been copied from 35 mil nitrate down to 16. Um, the Glenelg version, uh, its surviving tinted nitrate print, as held by the National Film and Sound Archive, is is also tinted. So the, there are some night scenes towards the end which are tinted, but unfortunately um, those tints have yet to be reapplied. What, what's been um, preserved so far is a black and white copy of the film. Um, we have a question from Rod Freeman. Uh, he asks, so he asks, so only one film has survived, but I believe you've shown two today, is that right? No, no, no. For, uh, Altogether, four films have survived. So the version from Glenelg certainly survives. And the version from Grenfell. Grenfell, I knew, I knew it was very similar to, to, to the Grenelg name. Grenfell, and I think it's the versions of Young and, and, and one other. So there are, there are four altogether. Rod's actually brought up something interesting that I, I think you may have touched on in your talk that I wanted to ask. Um, I noticed that so only four films have survived, but you have a lot of newspaper clippings. So yes. I just wanted to ask how important has Trove been to your research process? Uh, look, Trove has been absolutely essential. It's just, it's just been brilliant. Um, when a film historian from an earlier generation called Eric Reed wrote about the adventures of Dot um, for a magazine called Cinema Papers in about 1974, 75, he was really scratching for information. I mean, really... Um, found it very difficult to find anything about it. Short of going, doing a tour around country town cinemas, um, he wouldn't have been able to put the story together. But his wife remembered that uh, Colac in Victoria had a version produced in the early 1930s. And, you know, thereby hangs an interesting tale because um, Jack St. Ledger um, apparently didn't see his wife and family after 1932. And yet Eric Reed's article about the Colac version quotes a local as saying that in about 1934, when the Colac version was made, St. Ledger was being assisted on the film by a woman he introduced as his wife. <laughs> Clearly can't have been his wife, but um, she apparently did the makeup and help with continuity and, and other, other aspects as well. But what Eric Reed actually did, he, phys he, and, he and his own wife had to physically travel up to Colac, go to the local library, um, do the research. They managed to track down some people. Um, there was somebody, uh, one of the leading men of the Colac version was actually quite well known already in the, in the district. He was a, a, a star football player. And um, he was still alive in the early 70s when Eric Reed in interviewed him and um, was able to incorporate some, some of that information. But yeah, look, uh, Trove has been such a boon. I mean, there are, there are still some gaps. I've, I've put together a list of close to 50 films, but there are, there are strange um, gap-like periods, like I think it's something like 1932 to 1934, where there are no digitized newspapers anywhere in Australia mentioning Adventures of Dot, or apparently so, not when I last checked. And that indicates that there are more papers still to be digitised. I think that, that project's going to go on forever. Um, and, you know, other, other resources would be um, probably newspapers that have yet to be digitised. So that although I don't know of Jack St. Ledger uh, being interviewed about his career up until the time of his death, that's not to say that newspapers in the 1950s and perhaps early 60s didn't run a story on him. So I'd be very interested if there are any um, viewers today that, that know a bit more about St. Ledger. I've also been trying to um, track down members of St. Ledger's family. Very gradually, I've been finding names on Ancestry and other resources. So I'm, I'm hoping at least to um, contact one of the descendants, whoever their family historian might be, 
and um, at least obtain a photograph of him because there's one very blurry photo, I think, of him shooting the uh, Glenelg version in 1938. But apart from that, I've, I've found no images of him at all. And if anyone did have any images like that, should they, um, have, is there a place for them to send them or contact or anything like that? Oh, I think if they contact the RAHS and, and the RAHS can, can get back can to me get... after that, yeah. Great. All right, so Mark has a question for you. Uh, he asks, were these films copyrighted or registered in any way? Uh, the script was copyrighted. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the, the pages held by National Archives are held by National Archives because that was part of the co copyright registration process. Um, it's quite interesting that uh, Len Roos, the Canadian-born mostly American working filmmaker who visited Australia briefly in the late 20s was able to kind of copyright it. Um, but apparently, you know, if you weren't and you presumably uh, are not still a resident, then, then you can do that anyway. I, I have a suspicion that um, Len Roos and his older brother, Charles Roos, had produced, on, had, had produced some of these home talent films in Canada or America. But finding that information has been quite difficult. There are just a couple of hints in information about Lynn Roos that I've found to him working on uh, one or two small town films. One more question from Christine, uh, and it's about the nitrate stock again. Could the volatile nature of that stock uh, have contributed to its disappearance? I think there are a couple of um, factors at play here. Yes, certainly the, the volatile and easily perishable nature of nitrate stock could have meant um, that it, it, you know, a lot of copies have perished over the years. But, but there's also the, the aspect of people over the years deciding what's significant, and what's important to be preserved. And although country town audiences may have been absolutely, you know, charmed and thrilled with the adventures of Dot episodes at the time that they were made. It's not to say that five, 10, 15 years later, they felt any great need to preserve them. I mean, I'm, I'm, look, I'm doing a bit of second guessing here, but the fact that only four copies out of at least 50 editions from around Australia have, have been found, found to survive is an indication of the importance um, or, the, or perhaps the lack of importance people have, have placed on preserving them. Um, they were community films, they were amateur films. Um, I'm, there's a possibility that had they been a Sinner Sound or Charles Chevelle feature film of the 1930s, um, they, they're more likely to have survived. But the other aspect is that the, the loss rate of Australian nitrate films um, has, has been gigantic, um, particularly silent era films made before 1930. I mean, it's just, it's, it's fast. Um, American producers could usually afford and were motivated to make more prints of their films. So um, a lot of American, although lo the losses of American silent films have been huge, um, a lot of American films have tended to survive um, because multiple copies were made and, and distributed. Whereas in Australia, sometimes there are only one or two copies, if they. Interesting. Um so we've managed to get through all the questions, um, which is great. Uh, I, I was, you've previously written about this for our history magazine uh, in December 2019. And I would encourage anyone who is interested in reading a little more about this subject uh, to contact the RAHS and we can organise uh, a purchase of that magazine if you're interested to read a little more. Um, do you have any final words, Graham, before we close up for the day? Uh, well, look, thank you everyone for, for, for tuning in today. I mean, I, I've always been attracted by um, little known stories and I, I, I'm a bit of a natural history detective in terms of you know, tracking down such stories. And I think um, there's a lot more still to be researched and told about Australia's hometown at films, not only the adventures of Doc, but you know, Adventures of Dot is, is, is a large part of it. Um, and I just suggest to anyone in, in you know, communities out there who might live in towns or large regional centres, um, if you know of a, of, a, of a Dot film being made in your district, um, I encourage you to research it and, and maybe even to see if you can do a bit of asking around the neighbourhood to see if um, any of these further films have survived. 
Well, it's been a wonderful talk, Graham, and I, and I encourage our audience to give you a virtual clap um, once again. Um, thank, you. thank you. It's been terrific. Right. Well, thank you, Philip, and thank you, Christine. Yeah.